up until this point our focus has been on deriving the governing equations for the incompressible irrotational flows in this lesson let us step further and look at how to obtain solutions for these equations for some simple flow fields for all the flow fields that we will look at in this lesson the solution strategy will be very similar we will first define the flow field based on certain known parameters such as the velocity of the flow we will then derive the governing equations for the stream function or the velocity potential further later in the lesson we will see how to superimpose multiple functions obtained from simple flow fields to create a complicated and realistic fluid flow problem the first elementary flow field we will consider is that of a uniform flow that is the constant velocities in the x and the y directions from the definition of the velocity potential we know that the gradient of the velocity potential is the velocity of the fluid integrating these two equations with respect to the x and y directions respectively we get two governing equations for the same variable that is the velocity potential by comparing these two relations we can write the functions f of y and g of x as shown here substituting for these in the velocity potential equation we get the following governing equation for the uniform flow in a similar fashion based on the definition of the stream function we have the following relations that relate the velocity components to the gradients of the stream function i will let you work it out yourself but after integrating comparing and substituting we obtain the governing equation for the stream function for this uniform flow field in order to visualize the profiles for these functions let us assign numerical values to the two velocity components by doing so we will be able to plot the streamlines and the equipotential lines as shown here streamlines as we discussed previously describe the direction of the motion of the fluid the equipotential lines on the other hand as seen here are orthogonal to these streamlines let us now look at another case imagine a two dimensional flow where the fluid is emanating radially outward from a single point based on this information we can immediately draw the streamlines which look like this such a flow field is called a source flow and the point is referred to as the source if instead we have fluid radially flowing towards the point we call the point a sink and the flow is referred to as a sink flow you can think of the sink flow as a negative source flow let us now consider just the source flow if we specify that the velocity of the fluid reduces as it moves radially away from the source we can write the radial component of the velocity in the following form and since we are not specifying any rotational velocity the angular velocity can be assumed to be zero now that we have the velocity components by following the same process we did for the uniform flow problem we can calculate the stream function and the velocity potential equations assuming a numerical value for the source strength we can plot the above equations to show the orientation of the streamlines and the equipotential lines for the source flow here is a challenge for you now that you know how to solve for a source flow try to obtain a solution for the sink flow to get you started here is a big clue sink flow is just a negative source flow let us now shift gears and create a new flow based on the principle of superposition 
using the uniform source and the sync flows that we just looked at. As we discussed in the previous lesson, the Laplace equation is a linear equation, which means we can combine multiple solutions of the Laplace equation to create a new solution. This is the principle of superposition. We have already derived that the stream function is the solution of the Laplace equation. Let us now create a new stream function which is the sum of the stream functions of the uniform source and the sync flows. For the uniform flow, we are enforcing that the flow is strictly horizontal. That is, there is no V component of velocity. If we now plot the sketch for this new stream function, we can notice two distinct zones. The source and the sink appear to create an elliptical envelope and the uniform flow appears to be deflected around the envelope. As such, there is no interaction between the outside and the inside flows. As a result, it is possible to replace the flow field inside the oval with a solid body that has the same shape as that of the envelope. By doing so, we have just created a flow field for an incompressible, irrotational, inviscid flow around an oval-shaped solid body. This is a significant milestone in fluid dynamics since it has enabled engineers to come up with solutions based on combination of elementary potential flows. The flow around the oval shaped body was first studied by Scottish engineer Rankine and hence is also called the Rankine Oval. It is now time to introduce our third elementary flow that is the doublet or the dipole. Here we consider a source and a sink pair of equal but opposite strengths separated by a distance. The stream function for this combination can be simply written as shown here. Let us now start reducing the distance between the source and the sink. However, while doing so, we will proportionally increase the strength of the source and the sink such that the product of their strengths and the distance between the two source and the sink is constant. Let us denote this product as kappa and call it the strength of the doublet. We can then write the stream function for this combination of flows as shown here. This function upon solving gives the following equation for the stream function of the doublet. The plot of this stream function shows a double lobed circular flow. At this point, you might be thinking, so how is this useful? Well, let us now combine this solution with a uniform horizontal flow. The equation for the stream function we get is shown here. Graphing this equation shows something that is very profound. Similar to what we have with the Rankine Oval, we now have two distinct regions that do not interact separated by a circular envelope. The region inside the envelope can be replaced by a cylinder of equivalent radius, where the radius depends on the velocity of the free stream and the strength of the doublet. This flow field now describes an incompressible, irrotational, inviscid flow around the cylinder. We can get the pressure distribution on the surface of the cylinder by using the Bernoulli's principle. If we plot the pressure distribution, we notice that the upper and the lower sides have a symmetrical pressure distribution. That is, there is no net vertical force. Or in other words, there is no a lifting force on the body. Also, the front and the back pressure distribution is symmetrical about the vertical axis. That is, there is no horizontal or pushing force on the cylinder. Digressing here for a bit. 
I am sure you must have put your hand out of a moving car and felt the air push your hand away. This force of the air is called the drag force. Scientists back in the 18th century must have also done this but must have put their hands out of a horse carriage but still felt the pushing force. Strangely, our calculations just showed that there is no net horizontal force or drag force on the cylinder. This is called the D'Alembert's paradox, named after the scientist who first encountered this dilemma. It is now time to consider our fourth and final elementary flow, that is, a vortex flow. Let us imagine that we have a flow where the streamlines are concentric circles around a center point, as shown in this image here. We will impose that the velocity along each of these streamlines is constant but varies between each streamline. We will also note that the angular velocity of each of the streamlines is inversely proportional to the distance of the streamline from the center. Such a flow is called a vortex flow or a potential vortex. For this flow, we have the following form for the angular velocity along a streamline. In order to calculate the value of the constant, let us recall the definition of circulation. Circulation is the line integral of velocity along a closed curve. Since the streamlines in the vortex flow are also closed curves, the circulation strength for each of these streamlines in terms of the angular velocity can be written as shown here. Comparing with the definition of angular velocity in the vortex flow, we immediately notice that the constant is dependent on circulation. Using the same process as all the other previous potential flow problems we discussed in this lesson, we can derive the governing equations for the vortex flow both in terms of velocity potential and the stream function. Previously, we saw how a combination of the uniform flow with a source and a sink flow resulted in a flow around a moving cylinder. If we now superimpose the vortex flow with that of the uniform flow past a circular cylinder, we will arrive at the solution for a flow past a rotating cylinder. It is a straightforward process to extract the velocity components from the stream functions. From the velocity of rotation of the cylinder, we can also extract the solution for the pressure coefficient. If we now plot the pressure distribution, we obtain an asymmetric distribution between the upper and the lower surfaces of the cylinder. This indicates that there is a net force in the vertical direction which we refer to as the lifting force. This force is proportional to the circulation and the equation relating the two which we see here is the famous kata jukowski theorem. Even today, many design studies in problems that involve asymmetric pressure distributions on a solid body say a flow around an aircraft wing, still use this theorem to get a first estimation of the lift force.